What is up, everyone? Welcome to Let's Play Maniac Mansion. One of my first gaming memories ever was playing this, so I am pretty excited to be Let's Playing this. It's been a long, long time coming. Maniac Mansion is a B-movie pastiche, and it's a point-and-click adventure game. It's a game created by Ron Gilbert and Gary Winnick of, Lu of LucasArts, two names that you should definitely be familiar with if you're at all interested in the genre. It was the first game LucasArts both designed and published themselves, and it's also a super revolutionary game. But we will digress from all of that right now because we just kind of skip past the character selection. So in Maniac Mansion, you get three characters, one of which is always Dave, and they all have different abilities. And those abilities change how you beat the game and how you make your way through the mansion, and they also... the characters also can influence which ending you get. So, there was Sid and Razor, we picked Sid, they're just kind of gender swaps of one another. And they both play the piano, they have some other music-related abilities that I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to show off. They, uh, Sid also has a unique property, Sid and Razor, I believe, ha both have this property. Can't talk about it just yet, but it's pretty cool. Michael can develop film, Wendy's a writer, Jeff can fix the phone, Bernard can win the game on his own with his abilities, which, again, we'll talk about later. Plus, he is also super helpful because having him around is the only way to bail yourself out of a, de a dead end if you miss a certain event later on. He just has a slight little drawback of being a huge coward, which affects something that you're going to see later in this episode. So I wanted my lineup to include Sid and or Razor. I just prefer Sid. I think he looks cooler. And I wanted it to also include Bernard, because I want the game to be beatable with only two kids. So, those two kids are probably going to be Dave and Bernard. You'll see why later, once again. Sorry for always having to tease that. That's a pretty iconic sign, by the way. Trespassers will be horribly mutilated. That's a sign that's not in the NES version of the game. A lot of stuff actually changed for the NES version of the game, but for now, you see, we have a ton of commands down here we can use. We can read, open, pick up. So, we just move that doormat out of the way, pick the key up, unlock the front door, and then Dave is gonna sit there on his ass, like the stoop kid, for a very significant portion of the gameplay, while Sid and Bernard do most of the important work for a large chunk of the game. And while Dave is chilling out and his buddies do all the work rescuing Dave's girlfriend, Wendy, let's talk about the way the game works and the history of it. So first, we're going to send Sid and Bernard inside. If you didn't know how to open this door up over here on the right, you need two kids. You need one to push the gargoyle. Is it this one? Is it the one? No, it's the one on the right. So the gargoyle on the right side of the stairs on the banister, you have one kid push this, the gargoyle, and that will open the way down to this little basement area. I think this is the room that's adjacent to the dungeon, which we'll talk about more in due time. You have to kind of, uh, kind of hover your mouse around, click around, looking for where the light switch is in these kinds of rooms. I know there's a better way to do it, but off the top of my head, I can't remember how. So I usually just click turn on and then just spam click all over the place. And the light switch is right there to the left of the stairs. So while we're going through here, I was talking about, I was going to talk about history. Maniac Mansion... In the, in the intro spiel, I mentioned that it's a pretty revolutionary game, and that's because it represents a very important step forward in the evolution of the adventure game genre. So in the beginning, we had text adventures, which were, uh, which were eventually replaced by graphical adventures, but graphical adventure games were based around typing, and the game would have to then parse whatever verbs and objects you typed in, which was for the time the best solution, but it created this really clunky guessing game. Now, Maniac Mansion was not the first to implement this point-and-click menu-based verb system, but it was one of the earliest, and it was by far the most popular of its time. Also, as a unrelated side note, Eugene Levy created a Canadian sitcom based around Maniac Mansion that had almost nothing to do with the game. Kind of like that, how that little aside had nothing to do with what I was just talking about with adventure games. Uh, so anyway, Ron Gilbert, a name you should know, 
was working on Coronis Rift at the time, I think it was called. And Gary Winnick was working on an adaptation of Labyrinth. That's right, David Bowie's Labyrinth. And they created Maniac Mansion together after that. So since I keep saying that you should be familiar with Ron Gilbert's name... By the way, if you bring Bernard up here to the security door, do not read the inscription on the keypad. It will cause the house to blow up. And also, only Bernard can do this. He can He's the only one who can open up the radio and pick up the old radio tube in here. As soon as I can click it. There we go. So I mentioned uh, Ron Gilbert and Gary Winnick are two names you should know if you're interested in adventure games. That's because Ron Gilbert is responsible, at least in part, for games like Zack McCracken, uh, Day of the Tentacle, Monkey Island. More recently, he put out The Cave. I think that was very early last year he put that out. And then Gary Winnick worked on many of the same games as Ron Gilbert as an artist, an animator, a team lead, and so on. Tim Schafer also, who also made a, a little old game called Brutal Legend, which Mike and I are doing an LP of right now, and a much more popular game called Psychonauts. Uh, Tim Schafer got his start on Maniac Mansion, I think doing more like trivial type stuff. I don't think he had a huge, huge role in Maniac Mansion, I could be mistaken on that. Dave Grossman also started his career on this game. And then... I believe Tim Schafer went on to direct Day of the Tentacle. Feel free to correct me if I if I completely misattributed all of that. So the devs attributed having very little creative oversight as being why they made such good games. Games like, again, Zack McCracken, Day of the Tentacle, Maniac Mansion. They attributed not being really constricted by LucasArts as a, they didn't have very tight restrictions on what they could or could not do, so they were free to just make something awesome. As opposed to current AAA market, the current AAA market, where everything is dictated by publishers and focus testing and where nothing can go through without extensive market research. Oh shit, I forgot she was still here. Shit. Okay. Uh, if you run into this situation, usually if you wait a couple minutes, Edna will not be in the kitchen, but if you do happen to get surprised by her and she's at the fridge and she chases you, just make sure you get out of the kitchen in time. We'll talk about the chainsaw in a second. Just make sure you get out of the kitchen in time as she's chasing you, and then when you pop back into the kitchen, she will have disappeared. The version... Um, do I want to talk about that first or the chainsaw? Oh, notice the Pepsi can. That is, I believe, the first use of product placement in a game. Fun stuff, product placement. Okay, so the chainsaw, which I just picked up back there. I think I'll talk about that before I go into my other thought. The chainsaw has no use in this game because there is no gas for it in this game. You can pick it up, but you can't actually find any function for it. There's a little callback to that in Zack McCracken, where there's a can of gas, but that can of gas is only used for a chainsaw, a chainsaw which is not in the game. It's a fun little reference to uh, the chainsaw from Maniac Mansion. So what I was going to say was something I was alluding to earlier, which is that there was a heavily censored NES version. Now, the NES version happens to have awesome music. The version of the game I'm playing does not have its own music most of the time. It has a few little bits of background music for certain occasions, but it doesn't have anything that's nice and constant, and for the most part, the background music in this version of the game isn't nearly as terrific as the music that they put in when it was ported to the NES. So what I'm doing, or what I'm planning on doing, <clears throat> I'm going to throw that on in the background to liven things up. If you've watched any of my early adventure series videos, the intro music is from a TV spot for Maniac Mansion, the NES version. So, I'm not playing the NES version, but I will be inserting some music as background music because it is so, so, so good. And real quick, actually, before I talk about the different versions, this is another important element of the game. And it's also, uh, Ned go, go into the kitchen there is also the reason that I made sure that I parked Sid and Bernard and Dave all out of the hallways. Because otherwise, while he's going through the hall to get to the kitchen, he can capture those kids and take them to an area called the dungeon. 
Um, the game uses these cutscenes that are based on an internal timer and they aren't triggered necessarily by what you're doing. Some of the cutscenes in the game are, but there's an internal timer uh, ticking that you can't really see ever. You just kind of have to have an intuitive feel for what event is going to happen and when. And then if something goes wrong with your plan, you have to have a backup plan to bail you out. That's what I was talking about with Bernard earlier. If you don't have Bernard, there is an internal, an internally timed event, a cutscene, where Ned will go out to pick something up outside, and if you do not get to what he's going after before he does, you kind of hit a dead end unless you have Bernard. If it's the thing that I'm thinking of, which is pretty a pretty vague description. Um, anyway, the different versions of the game. Let's go from there. So the original version of Maniac Mansion was made for the Commodore 64, the PC, and the Amiga. Also, I think Sid is the only person who can turn the TV on here. This guy will become, can become, important later, depending on some of the things you choose and the characters you take. So there was the original version on the Commodore, the, P the PC, and the Amiga. There is an enhanced version, which is more detailed, it has better shading, it's more colorful, that I think was all, that was put out on the Amiga and the PC. There's a really weird looking Japanese version for the Super Famicom, which I think is just the Super NES. Or am I just, or is, was it just the regular Famicom? And then there was a fan remake version using the AGS engine, and it had the, the Day of the Tentacle interface and all that, which is kind of cool. It's kind of smoother graphically, but I just can't get behind the art style. I can't get used to it. And then, of course, there is the very famous NES port. This statue, by the way, is not in that port. The NES port was heavily, heavily censored. And I will talk about the many ways that things were censored in that, in that version over the course of the playthrough as they come up. That statue was one of them. I think we're going to be heading into a room coming up that was also heavily censored. Is this the dark room? No, this is, um, okay, this is Ned's little exam room. You can see on the wall, he has some fake diplomas. He is, what was this? Is this just a diagram of the brain? Yeah, he has a degree in homeopathy. You have a degree in baloney. So some general stuff that was censored in the NES version. Uh, kill was a word that had to be removed wherever it came up. Characters could kill one another. The action was apparently fine, but using the word kill, that was taboo. There is some dialogue at some point in the game about something or someone, I should say, being pissed off. That had to be changed because Nintendo was apparently mad that they were using the word pissed off. I think that got changed to it's going to be mad. There was a poster. I can't remember if we passed it already. I, my eyes are kind of just glazing over as I play. There's a poster around that reads Disco Sucks that, that just straight up doesn't exist in the NES version. Oh, this is the room I was thinking of. Uh, this poster back here is just a little reference to Zack McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders. Let's see, it's not... Oh, I thought it might have been the disco... The can of gas on Mars. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> the disco crazy cabinet is not the one I was thinking... There we go. Kill Thrill. Kill Thrill is an interesting one. <laughs> it's... It's probably one of the best examples in the whole game of how stupid censorship of it was so originally the, the arcade read as kill thrill and for the NES version that was changed to muff diver because can't have the word kill in there so they just changed it to muff diver and then it got flagged for being sexually suggestive and the I think the final change that was made to it the one that got approved and is actually in the NES version I think it's called Tuna Diver. <laughs> uh, so remember I was talking about how Bernard is kind of a coward? If you take Bernard up here, this is why I collected all this stuff with Sid instead. If you take Bernard up here, 
to feed the tentacle. Bernard freaks out and runs away, so you need to use either Sid or Dave or whoever your other kids that you picked are. I am going to feed him the bowl of wax fruits, and then I'm also going to follow that up. I'm going to give him a chaser of, I think it's the fruit drinks that he likes. If you give him the can of Pepsi, he says it makes him burp. Alternatively, if you want to feed him something, this is the dark room, I think. So we're just going to leave. Alternatively, if you want to feed him something else, you can collect every single piece of food that you find between the kitchen and uh, the room in the back of the, like, the storage room near the pool, where the pool leads out to. Or rather, where the storage room leads out to the pool. I have my words backwards. Okay, we're going to start working Bernard up there, by the way. If you collect all the food, like I think there's some lettuce, there's a rotten turkey in the dining room, you have to get the cheese. There's a bunch of stuff that you have to get. You can feed all of those to him one by one. That takes too much time, it's too tedious. Fuck that. So we just feed him a bowl of wax fruits and that's just as good to the tentacle. There's also some tentacle chow that you have to find. And then all of that gets screwed up anyway if you don't collect all those items of food before Ned gets into the kitchen and he picks out the cheese from the fridge. Mmm, 64 slices of American cheese. <laughs> okay, for terrible acts of violence, call 0525. I have to remember that. That's actually really important later. Also, I think I need both kids to read that sign, otherwise they don't know who to call. If I'm remembering that right, it's the Meteor Police. I think that number is randomized. There are, I want to say it's like five or six different numbers that that can be. And I'm trying to remember what all of those allude to. I know one possible number for the Meteor Police is 1138, which refers to Lucas's first film, which was THX 1138. And there are a couple other numbers. I don't remember what all of them are. But we are out of time for this episode. Thanks for watching, everyone. Take it easy. Have a good one.